नमस्ते एंड वेलकम टू दिस एक्साइटिंग एपिसोड ऑफ सत्तोलॉजी डी बंकिंग मिथोलॉजी सत्तोलॉजी मीन साइंस ऑफ ट्रूथ एंड स्टडी ऑफ ट्रूथ अपोजिट ऑफ दैट इज मिथोलॉजी व्हिच मीन साइंस और स्टडी ऑफ फेक लाइव और इमेजिनेशन यू नो रीड द डिस्क्लेमर ऑन आवर शोस यू नो वी वी सिलेक्ट अ स्पेसिफिक धार्मिक व्यू व्हिच इज वेरी न्यूट्रल नाइदर लेफ्ट नॉर राइट प्योर एनालिसिस एंड प्योर कंटेंट बेस्ड ऑन धार्मिक वैल्यूज एट द सेम टाइम थैंक यू फॉर मेकिंग अस आवर शोस गो वायरल ऑन यूट्यूब और आप लोग का बहुत बहुत स्वागत है इस शो में और आप सबका बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद कि आप लोगों ने हमारे शोज को इतना पॉपुलर किया है एंड कीप लाइकिंग दिस शो एंड सब्सक्राइबिंग टू दिस चैनल टुडे हम लोग बहुत इम्पोर्टेंट इश्यूज पे बात करने वाले हैं एंड दी मेनी ऑफ द अमेरिकन स्टूडेंट्स हु आर इंटरेस्टेड इन इंटरनेशनल डिप्लोमेसी इंटरनेशनल लॉ देन फॉर देम दिस शो विल पर्टिकुलरली यूजफुल and uh, there is a parallel show running right now on yoga taken up by melissa so do check check it out also and uh, which is on our regular channel for the universities so without delay let us begin so i have a very special guest general dhruv katoj let's welcome him namaste and welcome sir uh thank you aditya dhanyawad it's always a pleasure being uh, on your show thank you thank you very much appreciate that so the the current lot of things have changed and changing very fast i mean, lot of people cannot even fathom it the us southern borders are open israel war ukraine war is about to end almost it has ended it is, it is now ending now but other wars are starting the red sea blockage is going on so first you tell me like what is from your point what is going on actually why what is going on right now you know um aditya let me start with the uh, russia ukraine war no i think this was a war which was thrust on the people of russia uh, they were forced onto it by certain policies of the nato countries especially that expand they tend to expand eastwards right and uh, the russians felt threatened and rightly so because certain guarantees were given to them when the when the soviet union uh, was about to collapse that okay nato will there will be no further expansion of nato but that didn't happen they continued expanding and i think ukraine was the last straw uh ukraine has got a president uh, mr zelensky who i think has not really looked after the interests of his people he has not understood that U- the ukrainian people are being used as fodder to fight a proxy war between the americans and the russians now two years uh, that war is going on two years um uh, it will subside at some point of time but it will only subside once the ukrainians give in and i think the west has no further appetite to continue this particular war uh prior to that of course we had the afghan conflict today nobody talks about afghanistan because you know events have overtaken them we have the russia ukraine war and nobody is really talking about russia ukraine because the israeli hamas conflict has started and that has, that will be a very very bitter uh, conflict now uh, thousands of people have already died many more will die but i think the worst is yet to come and that is going to be what is going to happen in the gulf i i have always been a uh, very very worried about a conflict taking place in the gulf and it is not from what is happening now that there there is a possibility of a, a blockade on the red sea it is much before that when the cold war was really playing out because any blockage of shipping routes and the energy routes from the gulf impacts india directly and i want to make one very bold statement here should a war break out and the energy uh, uh, the energy resources be impacted then there are only two countries which will be relatively well off one is russia which is totally uh, you know which is an oil exporting country they don't have to worry and the second is the united states but for the rest of the world you know you take india china japan uh, most parts of europe we are energy dependent and a war in the gulf will cripple the shipping and will put paid to any of the energy resources moving out now if there's a short war which can be contained within say 2 weeks or a month 
that is okay. But there's no guarantee that it won't last on for a very long period, the way the Russia-Ukraine war is, uh, has, has continued. So I think that is going to be a very major problem. I view that as the biggest threat facing the world, rather than what is happening in Israel or in Russia, in the Russia-Ukraine war. Because this is going to impact, should it occur, uh, it'll be a black swan event, or perhaps a grey rhino. But should it occur, all of us are going to be impacted very severely, and India is going to be very badly hit. Aditya. Now, if you look at today's uh, press conference by, by interview by Prime Minister Modi to Financial Times, very, very strong interview in a way. I mean, so delivered in a very soft way, but very strong interview very clearly says that the India's priorities are independent. India's priorities is focused on developing its own people. And uh, Hindi mein sunna chahte unke liye, ki Bharat ka jo jo interview diya, unhone bola ki India ke priorities are to protect its own people. Basically, that's the message. And, and the controversy which American citizens have created, which are so-called asylum seekers in USA, like Panun and other people. And they have actually affected the ties with India and if this intimidation continues then India will take its own steps. So what do you think on this side actually? Uh, very, very frankly I think this has been a very sorry episode and there are multiple reasons for it but I want to get down to the Prime Minister's statement first because it's a very important statement delivered with a great deal of finesse. Now what exactly did the Prime Minister say? Uh, to cut it short, there were three major points which he has made. One, if there is any merit to what the United States are alleging, and there is somebody in India who has actually plotted to kill uh, Panun, whom we call a terrorist, and who is a citizen of the United States and of Canada, he's got dual citizenship, well, our agencies will investigate it. And a high part level inquiry has already been set up. So that first part of it, he has made it very clear that India abides by the rule of law. You present as the evidence, we will investigate. That is one. But I think he also put it across very well that we are in this fight together against terrorism. And I think the point which he made very clearly was, that terrorist ko ye jo panun hai, is a declared terrorist by India. You are permitting his activities within, within the soil of the United States. This man has threatened Indian diplomats. He has threatened to blow up Indian uh, passenger planes. Yet he finds refuge in the United States. I think he made it, he, he gave a hint to them that this thing cannot get continue. And the third point which he made was, which I think is very significant, he said these, you know, uh, there will be within two friendly countries issues will always be there it isn't that we are going to agree with each other 100% of the time but broadly if something goes wrong we will deal with that separately but we will not let it derail the larger relationship between India and the United States and I think here he is referring to the excellent rapport with the Prime Minister of India has with the former president of the United States and the present president of the United States, as also the excellent diplomatic links uh, and security links which have been established between the two countries. You know, you have the two plus two meetings when you're talking about defense and external affairs, and they become a regular feature. And most importantly, as far as India is concerned, our interests coincide completely with the United States when it comes to the uh, Indian Ocean region and in, into the Indo-Pacific. Now, there the larger threat which the world is going to face and which is certainly the Americans are going to face because the challenger is there and the challenger is China. So it is not Russia which the Americans should be concerned about or any other power. I think they have to be concerned about what China is doing and the aggressive policies it continues to follow in the South China Sea, its uh, movement into the Indo uh, into the uh, Indian Ocean, and if it breaks the first island chain, it will be all over the Pacific. 
So I think the Americans need to be very, very concerned about what the Chinese aim to do because they have made their aims very clear. By 2049, they will be the leading power, displacing the United States. Now, whether that happens or not, we, time will tell. But that is their stated aim. And I think when we're looking at a challenge, a security challenge, both for India and for the United States, it is China. And confronting this challenge in the Indo-Pacific, I think the Quad is the right answer. Other countries can, of course, join the Quad. But the point is, um, yeah, Indian and American interests coincide completely. Now, when we are looking at the Asian, uh, uh, at the landmass, you know, the continent, there we have a different set of interests, you know, the continental interests. Now, as far as India was concerned, the uh, war between Russia and Ukraine was a tribal war, you know, to put it very bluntly. There are two tribes, white colored, they are fighting each other. It is not India's war. It is their war. So we see no reason why we should get engaged with that war either way. So if the Americans think that we should actually get on board to what the Americans say, I think the Indian External Affairs Minister, Mr. Jay Shankar, made it very clear. We are not here to propagate American interests or European interests or Russian interests. We are here to propagate the Indian interests. And I think that is a very subtle shift which has taken place in India's foreign policy. Many people say that we are following now the non-aligned point two. I don't think so. Non-alignment is the totally wrong word to use for the India's foreign policy. Let us talk of it in terms of strategic independence. I think the, the correct word is strategic independence. Bharat wohi karega jo Bharat ke haak mein hai. And that, I think, is the message which has been given by the Prime Minister, the External Affairs Minister, and by India's diploma, diplomats all across. Aritya. No, very well put. Very well put. Um, see, the recent, uh, if you see the recent uh, reports coming from the US, USCIRF, and uh, even though it's a defunct body, I did a whole show exposing them that not a single Hindu is on the religious, supposedly religious international freedom, not a single Buddhist there, not a single non Abrahamic faith person there. You know, there are two Jews, one Muslim, and rest everyone is a Catholic or a Christian. So doesn't represent the body for which it is made. And secondly, it is a CIA front. It is part of the State Department connected to U.S. aid. India is not a recipient of U.S. aid. And uh, India is much more, much more independent, even bigger than U.K., the British economy. So the still it created a lot of flutter in India where I thought I wanted to tell all our friends in India that uh, don't need to worry about it because even Americans don't even know about that organization. That organization exists only for outside countries, not the Americans itself. So no American even knows that agency exists. But and any noise they make is for internal consumption for policymakers. But the bipartisan support which India enjoys in the US, not a single politician from either side except Ilan Omar and Rashida Tlaib and some of these uh, woke Congress people, they are the ones who make noise and that too they make it for their own voters and funders only. Otherwise, it has no bearing. With that context, do you think that the one side of American state is working against India and one side is working for India or with India? Uh, you know, the way I have looked at this particular issue is American the, the American uh, interest lies in an India which is reasonably strong. But that interest starts getting hurt when India becomes very strong. So American interests and European interests are maintained when India is in a reasonable position to look after itself. But they do not want to see India as a competitor to the United States and to Europe. That is why they have this dual policy that where they choose, when it suits their interests, they will give you assistance. But they will also use a stick to keep India down on various issues like, you, you know, you can talk of human rights. You know, they can rake up any issue in India. You know, uh, religion is uh, 
is a much abused word, uh, which can be raked up in India. You know, the uh, the uh, the Muslim issue, the Kashmir issue. Um, there are issues with uh, within the states. You know, uh, there could be uh, uh, a movement created against nuclear power, right? Against the GM drugs for agriculture. So here, the, 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 such a large country, India, there will all 1.4 billion Indians don't think on the same lines. So regardless of whichever way India goes, there will always be some naysayers. Now, it is very easy for the West to catch hold of some of those naysayers, give them a few million dollars, and, you know, promote protests within India. The farmers' movement which took place uh, is, is a sure pointer to that. Even earlier, about when Barack Obama, Obama was the president, uh, they took up the issue that the Christian the churches are being vandalized. Now, any investigation carried out into such vandalization uh, proved the whole statement to be false. Because nothing extra had happened during the BJP rule than what had happened earlier. And every single incident was a case of minor theft. You know, a few dollars stolen from here or a few dollars stolen from there. And that's about it. There was no major, there was no case of vandalization per se. Yet it was raked up and it became an international issue. So I think the US will always maintain these pressure points. They will maintain these uh, so that they can tell India, if you don't conform, then we will make it very, very difficult very, very difficult for you. And I think that is the challenge which India has to face, that we have to tell them, listen, ours is an independent foreign policy. We believe in strategic autonomy. We are not going to side with anybody. But ultimately, our interest, the government of India, is working for the people of India. And we cannot put the interest of the people of India subordinate to the interests of the West. And the same message I think we give to the Russians. That we cannot subordinate our interests to your interests. So primis, the primarily, I think the change in this policy which has taken place is our national interests come first. And we have a strong political, uh, um, a political uh, uh, party in power. And we have got a very good diplomatic, uh, diplomatic core, of, uh, a core of diplomats uh, who are looking into this issue. So I think this change in foreign policy, which really started in 2014 by uh, the then External Affairs Minister Sushma Suraj and the present EAM, but basically led by the Prime Minister. I think that is bearing fruit now. And a realization is coming across. Ki, listen, India is a benign power. We are not here to hurt anybody's interests. Uh, the Prime Minister has made it clear we can all grow together. So when India grows, it is not going to be at the expense of the United States or Europe or Russia. In fact, if we grow, they will stand to benefit rather than stand to lose. Because when our, our people become well off, they are in a position to spend more money. And uh, obviously, uh, the imports which we, take, which we take from other countries, that will increase. So you see, it is going to be a win-win situation. We, we, don't, we are not here to covet anybody's territory. We are not laying claim to the Indian Ocean. We are not laying claims to any of our border areas. You know, historically, India has been self-sufficient. You know, we, we don't look outside to uh, capture territory. So to that extent, we are a very, very benign power. And I think that is the understanding which needs to be sent across to the world. I think, in a sense, there is an appreciation of that. But there is also a fear that India will be a very strong economic competitor. And nobody wants to lose out on the economic edge which they have. I mean, you look at our scientists, they are the best in the world. You know, your, our space program, though we didn't have much, we've achieved a great deal. And uh, I have a feeling that over the next decade or so, things are going to improve in a very major, in a very major manner. So that, I think, is a, is a cause of concern to some countries, though I don't think there should be a cause of concern. You know, uh, Jay Shankar Ji yesterday made a statement very powerful statement. He said, told the Indian diplomats, don't defend home matters in the West. What happens in the home, stop defending it. Because we are we are still in that colonial mindset of explaining everything to the West. You know, we have not challenged their human rights record. We have not challenged the discrimination against Hispanics, Anglo-Saxons in the US. We have not challenged discrimination against Indian Americans, Anglo-Saxons in the West. 
we have not challenged the 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 discrimination against hindus in every part of the world including canada there are so many hindu students getting killed over there we have not challenged their human rights records we have not challenged american policies of arming india's enemies which they did for many years now we know that the many reports unconfirmed books are coming out which say that lal bahadur shastri was killed by cia operation and also homi baba was killed by cia operation we have not challenged any of those things and we are still every time we are explaining defending and we are assuring them which straight away goes against the chanakya niti straight away goes against mahabharat where you should never assure your ideological dushman dushman is a one who thinks in the mind shatru is the one who can hurt you with weapons two different words so we have not we are assuring them that we are not going to attack you where mahabharat ramayana everything says attack the enemy first when they are weak the, the, so so are we are we like completely lost in self abnegation self abnegation and self pity you know aditya this question haunts us so much and it boils down to one thing you know the we are still in mind uh, uh, some part of our public at least the intellectual community some part of it uh they are ideologically compromised uh, let me put it that way the colonial um, the the colonization which has taken place in the mind they still have to get rid of it and uh, i think that is going to take some time the new generation which is coming up they have shed all that but the people who are still in the decision making stage you know the people in their 50s and 60s uh i think some of them at least need to set to shed the colonial mindset and here i'm seeing uh, to a very large extent the opposition ruled parties uh following this mindset you know when we when we uh, when covid struck india and the world rather and when we were making our, our vaccine there were many in india who were deriding the vaccine they wanted us to buy the pfizer vaccine you know the what the west is making is correct the what the west is making is good and what india is doing is substandard but ultimately we went ahead we made our own vaccine and we preserved our strategic autonomy because we would have been compromised otherwise now this is just one example but there were enough people in india in the political domain who said this vaccine is a bjp vaccine don't take it you know they were hell bent in destroying the great work which our scientists have done we go to the moon people deride it you know so if we are going to the moon the isro is doing such a great job and then there are people who say but with that money we could have fed so many people as if those things are you know uh, uh, without realizing that these things are mutually exclusive we will feed the people and we will go to the moon and we will have an independent foreign policy no it isn't one is not dependent on the other but in terms of mindset i'm afraid the mindset still hasn't changed in in many in many people but the good news is that change is coming about and this government has led to a revolution in many ways you know earlier on the religious angle you know if a, a high ranking person let us say who's in the cabinet if he went and visited a temple say 10 years ago a hindu you know they would call him communal but if a muslim went to the masjid or a christian went to the church they would say no he is he is a very religious man and he is a secular person so ultimately it was only the hindus who were categorized as being um, non secular to put it into the indian context right because they went to their own they, they are worshiping their own in their own manner and that was somehow thought to be that it doesn't uh, conform to the secular ethos of india but things are changing now you see the prime minister made that change very apparent you know he will go and now next month when we inaugurate the ram mandir in ayodhya the prime minister will be there a large number of his cabinet will be there uh, industrialists from all over the country will be there the who's who of india will be there and now there's no shame attached to it earlier people wouldn't do it so you won't find hindus going to temples just to show their secular credentials but you will find the muslims going to the mosque and the christians going to the churches you had a vice president of india who built a small little mosque inside the vice president's house and everybody thought that was secular 
So I think there's a this hypocrisy has to go. This hypocrisy into the colonial mindset. Colonialism is the word which 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 has been used, and this colonialism still hasn't died. And once that dies, India will rise and India will grow. And I think it is dying now. So this is what you are seeing now is the last gasp of the colonial the, the people who are still bitten by the colonial drug, who still feel that the white man is superior, who still feel that we Browns deserve to be kicked in the butt, but they are increasingly getting marginalized. The wokes, as we call them in India, they are getting marginalized. Aditya, the Indian diaspora mm-hmm. and India, I'll say Hindu specifically, because when you say India, everyone is included. Hindus are the most decolonized people. In terms of, if you look at the history properly, it was Jahangir the Four who invited East India Company from Kolkata port. It was not a Hindu king or anyone else. It was a Muslim king. So it was not about Muslim India. It was about Muslims invited them, and we still today see all the Islamic countries under the thumb of the West. They are all children are studying over there. Everything is going on. and uh, and it's a hypocrisy of theirs against their own people that they allow the western intelligence agencies to run amok amongst their societies uh in there is a hindu prime minister of uk there is a hindu prime minister of ireland i mean indian origin but not hindu but indian origin is a marathi and uh, and you can see the britain in U- us also a hindu is waking up the country a vivek ramaswamy so so it's the most decolonized person you see everywhere so what you correctly identified that the colonized mindsets are in india are the people who are paid to be the puppet of the foreign masters in india clearly news click incident also proved everything you know? so uh, you made a very valid point there that these are few people but at the same time there is a larger renaissance and if i see all other countries of the planet south america i live in us is south america and i see african union is waking up south americans are can not cannot wake up because they're completely wiped out so with this incident with this happening and the world looking to india as a leader of global south which is g21 and uh, india played a very leading role including african union do you see that the indian military which is considered one of the second largest volunteer force or largest volunteer force in the world uh going to play an important role in answering the allegations allegations and also telling people the real history of the west of every colonization and everything will that thing come because that pride is still i see missing over there what do you say So you know, as far as the uh, Indian Armed Forces are concerned, uh, they are not really involved in this uh, uh, trying to educate people on colonialism. That I think has to be the job of the education department. And uh, the way history is taught, I think the way history has been taught has been very lopsided as far as India is concerned. And despite se- seven decades of independence, we still haven't made appropriate corrections. Though a lot of work is going in that sphere, now um, you know to to put things into into perspective, the people who wrote history of in you know India's recent history, say the last three four hundred years, you know you glorified the Mughals, and you totally uh, you know when the Marathas defeated the Mughals, that portion of the history was not was left uncovered, so it was very selective. british victories were selective muslim victories were selective but the victories of the indian rulers they were not played out i think that change is taking place now we are we are trying to you know that there is a idea to go into indian history now and to give credit to the great indian warriors who fought for the pride of their country and they they range from all parts it is not simply marathas you know from assam you had you had some great rulers you had them in the central central india you had them in the north in fact from all parts of the country and none of them were given any coverage in our history books that is changing now but more importantly i think the change which is coming about now is there is no fear like if i am there <clears throat> there is no fear in my heart now that i am a hindu and i won't be if i go to a temple people will think that i am communal <clears throat> 
I think that fear is gone now. That uh, people are people will say, "Listen, I'm a Hindu and I'm secular," and I think you're proudly claiming that. But earlier, I think there was that even within the government circles, you know, uh, you gave certain concessions to even in your constitution to the Muslim groups and to the Christian groups because you didn't want them to feel left out. But now, what is happening is when you're trying to put everybody on an equal base. Those people feel that they are being cheated out of something, but that cheating out of something is really not there because they shouldn't have got it in the first place. You know, when we are looking at Indian society, every individual should be treated equally, but some were treated more equal than others. In fact, in Sonia Gandhi's uh, Manmohan Singh regime, under Sonia Gandhi's directions, they nearly took out a rule which said that if there is a riot, a communal riot, which takes place. Only the majority community will be held culpable. So that means a Muslim groups could actually create riots. They could bomb and stone Hindu houses, and the people who are getting bombed and stoned, they would be held culpable. Now, thankfully, that law didn't come up. But now it is. Now we are looking at things more equally and dispassionately, which is why some people think that they are being discriminated against. There is no discrimination. It is an equal application of the law, which had not been there since independence, but now it is being applied equally. That means it will apply to the Hindus, the Muslims, the Christians, and to anybody else. There's one more point I also want to give about the Muslim Ummah, which is so much spoken about, and you also spoke about the OIC in your opening remarks. You see, the OIC, as far as Kashmir is concerned, uh, they they are not bothered anymore, and nobody, even in the Islamic world. Nobody listens to the OIC. But the important point I want to tell you is the biggest abuse of human rights against Muslims has been done by China, and it is what they are doing to the Uyghur Muslims in the Xinjiang province or what was earlier East Turkmenistan. Not one Muslim country has opened its voice against that. Not one. Their mosques have been destroyed. Their preachers have been um, made to shave off their beards. The Quran is forbidden to be taught. Yet the Muslims are happy with the Chinese. Now I think there's a great deal of hypocrisy in what the Muslim world also is doing, what their Ummah is doing. Because when you talk of the Ummah, it is the most disparate force, and uh, it's it's an extremely hypocritical force. So I don't give much credence to the OIC, and. The last people they should be preaching to is India, who is which is, which remains a very vibrant polity and a very vibrant uh, 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 a democracy where everybody lives with equal rights. I mean, it? it is a historical fact that no Muslim has ever flourished in an Islamic country. No Muslim has ever flourished. Muslims achieve excellence in USA, in non-Islamic countries, and then they try to change those. Non-Islamic countries into the place from where they ran from. It is a historical fact. I mean, this is a, it is the biggest uh, you can say a mark on their own track record. I mean, in USA they'll talk about women freedom and everything, and they demand rights. And if somebody says, "Hey, in your country you had no not even right to walk freely," forget about talk. You are not right to write. You can only be accompanied by a brother, a husband, or a yeah. father. You know. So and. It's the biggest hypocrisy we have, and we see many of our uh, Iranian friends uh, who are <laughs> who are on the looking at their show and they're laughing, and they are the world's biggest proponent of freedom in their own country, and but in the U.S. they can actually speak; the others believe they cannot speak. So one question I had was going separately from going back to our context, which we spoke earlier, which I wrote to you, Victoria Nuland meeting Munir, Army Chief. And also, I mean, the Dawood controversy was all fake news. You know, everybody knows. So I won't touch it. Many of the channels have already touched it. And uh, and also, India coming closer to Russia right before Victoria Nuland met the our Pakistan Army Chief. So, what do you see with this coincidence? You see, I don't think of it as a coincidence. Uh, look at it this way: it in the second quarter of twenty twenty four. The Indian elections will be held, and it's going to be a very important. It's, this uh, 
2024 is going to be a very very vital ele election uh, as far as india is concerned now there is an attempt by certain agencies to have a regime change in india they have been trying it for quite some time and i've been observing this phenomena that you create disturbances and try to bring down the government but unfortunately for those people the indian government is a very popular government you know uh, the the amount of uh, uh, welfare activities which have taken place in india across the board across communities you know without favor to any particular one but you know touching the lives of the poor equally regardless of the religious affiliation has actually struck the struck the government in good uh, in good standing and that is why the modi government is going to win 2024 again now this is something which many in the west and in the east you know like russia and china including russia they don't want it they would like a pliable government in new delhi and towards that end they will work in regime change new zealand was also there in bangladesh and they don't want sheikh hasina to be there they want her opponent uh, to to win power and they will they will try to effect a regime change there they may succeed in bangladesh though i don't think they will in india there's no chance but what what new zealand's visit to the uh, the pakistan army chief indicates is that they may use pakistan as a card to try to browbeat india now that is also not going to work because pakistan generally in indian think tanks we have ceased to discuss i mean you know it's not worth discussing pakistan uh, they are unimportant we have relegated them to uh, you know they are outside our radar range now their economy is bankrupt they are facing very severe internal security challenges but most importantly their polity is split and the polity is split so badly that i don't see it coming together again which means that the army will continue to rule which means that the economy will never come up again so how will they use pakistan kashmir is a dead issue we aren't going to listen to them militarily they can do practically nix so what can pakistan do to hurt india i really haven't seen but they can use pakistan in whichever way they can to foment foment terrorist violence within india so we are i am looking at over the next 3 months uh, especially up to march renewed activity by terrorist groups armed and trained by pakistan to try and create damage within india i don't think we will allow it to happen but for every 99 successes one person may get through we will see as to how we deal with that but if we can trace it back to pakistan i'm afraid the consequences for that country will be very severe this time and and american state department also knows it very well i mean i think i think they know it but you know the when the foreign policy is run by 20 year olds by american state foreign policy you know you cannot match with the experience of depth of likes of jay shankar or even the low uh, lower i mean officials actually is officials cannot match it but the, but the same you know can be said of like you said correctly you know one man blatting through you know the israel palestinian war has shown one thing very clearly the complete confusion in usa on what to support what not to support but ultimately they sided with israel and uh, and the the human rights excesses dropping 29000 bombs and that to half of them were dumb bombs which has a higher collateral damage on palestine has been an issue and i think this is a human rights issue also where you know you cannot preach human rights now because you have done engaged in some activity which is against human rights and uh, pakistan we all know you know it's a very weak country and also it's a very dependent on financial aid from the west uh, we all know that and which is continuing last question is the large orders of tejas and large orders of uh, artillery guns and large orders so do you think india is preparing for a bigger war or potential bigger war or is just a no, you, no 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 i want to put the tejas issue into the correct perspective all our you know the entire the mig fleet the mig 21s 
the fleet is over. They are, they are they have been replaced. The MiG 29s, the Jaguars, all of them have to be replaced. They're very old aircraft. And the Tejas is the replacement. So uh, at the upper end aircraft, we have the Rafale. I think we will get another 28 or um, 36 more aircraft at some point of time. But ultimately, it is going to be the Tejas and the AMCA, as far as India is concerned, which is going to be uh, servicing the needs of the Indian Air Force. And uh, it has got nothing to do with uh, ramping up, what do you call it, uh, uh, air power. It is simply getting onto par with what we had earlier. You see, we had 42 squadrons earlier. They are, they've come down to about 30 odd now. We need to build that up to at least 35 to 36 squadrons. And that is going to, that is going to take place over the next, 10, uh, next decade or two decades. So to say that it's being in preparation for a war, uh, I don't think so. As far as the artillery is concerned, uh, again, uh, you know, the first time we changed the Bofors gun, which was used in the Gargal War, and they were bought in the 70s and 80s, in the 80s, I think. Uh, it has taken three decades to change that gun. And now the change has started. But as far as the artillery is concerned, we are indigenizing now. So we are making our own guns. And not only will they be used for Indian defense, they will be used to export also. We will be able to give the world a cheaper gun, a more proficient gun than what other countries can. And uh, we will give it up, you know, along with the ammunition, etc. So I think in terms of defense preparedness, what India is trying to do now is to indigenize. Artillery is one of the examples of indigenization. The Air Force still has got a long way to go. The Navy is doing far better. But uh, in the Indian Air Force, when we are looking at the Tejas Mark II, um, we have to make those engines, which we are now making with US collaboration, the F-414, the, the General Electric F-414 engine. So that is going to be made with collaboration with the US. Uh, so General Electric will collaborate with HAL and we'll manufacture those engines. But these things are well into the future. You know, it's not something which is going to come up within the next year or two years. We are looking at a decade from now uh, for these aircraft to come up. In fact, it may take more than a decade, um, and th which means that completely rehauling the uh, Indian Air Force is going to be a very long, uh, very long procedure, and will take a lot of time. Uh, it is more defensive in nature. It's got nothing to do with uh, um, dealing with Pakistan or China, but it has got certainly something to do with being capable of countering any threat which may come from our opponents or which may come from the oceans. You know, India is very happy with, uh, this is the last question actually, and because of you, you know so many things about this aspect, military aspect, I'm going to just ask this question. Won't India need a bomber like B-52 in future? We need, a, we need like to protect such long shores and uh, we cannot be depending on all the time with European or Russian platforms. No, you know, when we're looking at protecting, uh, firstly, India has to protect its land borders. You know, so we have a border with Tibet, we have a border with Pakistan. And then we have got, of course, the maritime coast, you know, which is huge. So we have got two naval commands and uh, with two, two aircraft carrier and the third one will come in. So I think that will be cap that will take care of the interest as far as uh, securing the uh, maritime area is concerned, uh, along with the destroyers and frigates, etc., which we will be getting. And as far as the land borders are concerned, I think we are appropriately we, we have got appropriate force to defend ourselves. I don't think the aim is there to go and uh, you know free Tibet or to uh, break Pakistan into more pieces. Uh, that is not the aim at all. So having a bomber, there has to be a military purpose behind it. And for the moment, I don't see that purpose uh, anywhere. So I think we need a strong and capable air force. But I don't think we need a bomber as of now. That's my view. But there may be others who are advocates of having a bomber, a long-range bomber. Um, in my view, for the moment, it is not required. I, I'm sure whenever India needs it and they plan it, they'll plan with a much deeper way. Not just like China, which is whose bombers are cannot go beyond 3,000 kilometers, which is a joke actually in many ways. So thank you so much, General Dhruv Katoj, and thank you all the viewers for watching. And thank you people for commenting so many questions you had for General. Uh, and I 
I asked all those questions also in my series and uh, you must have got a very detailed answer. Thank you so much for coming on the show today and uh, namaste to all the viewers. Dhaniyawad and namaste.